Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger and excited to be here with you yet again today, as always. This is the place to be for the number one transformation conversation. You know, you can get Dare to Dream on so many outlets. I just ask you to be sure to leave a five-star review and tell us your thoughts because what you do is you drive other people who are needing this level of conversation in their life to the show. And you can subscribe, it'll come right in your inbox every time one of the show launches. Also, you can subscribe to my newsletter, debbiedashinger.com. As well, the show is on YouTube, Deb on the Radio, BBS Radio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Libsyn, Learn Out Loud, yada, yada. You get it. You could just Google Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger and find us in so many different locations, countries, and states, states of mind as well. So. Today, a little bit later, I'm going to be featuring Rachel Can, and I'm so excited to have her here. Super duper treat for you guys, let me tell you. So I'll tell you a little bit about her, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's up today. What's up today? So Rachel Can is a poet, performer, ceremonialist, and initiated Sova through Kohenet Priestess Training Program. She's like, you got the Hebrew right, girl. Her poetry has been featured on Morning Becomes Eclectic on NPR and as The Weather on the podcast Phenom, Welcome to Night Vale. She was awarded the 2017 Outstanding Instructor of the Year at UCLA Extension Writers program. And I want to thank a couple of people for this show because without them, this wouldn't be a show. First of all, Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness and as well, Thinkific, the popular software platform. I just want to say, I don't have anyone sponsor this show whose product or services I do not use. It's really important. Uh, this is not just them vetting me, by the way. I also vet them. So I can tell you right now, my products and programs are up on Thinkific. Unbelievable drag and drop. And it is the place for small businesses, entrepreneurs to sell their products and their programs. It is so easy and beautiful. And if you don't have it yet, you got to. It is the thing for today that all entrepreneurs are using. You can easily create, market, and sell your online courses. Even Lewis Howes from the School of Greatness podcast says, you need to get on Thinkific. The team is creative, reliable, and offers unbeatable support. This is true. They always make sure all my bases are covered, and as a business owner, that's invaluable. I know you're ready to do this, so go to thnk.cc slash deb. The reason is they're giving you a special just for being a Dare to Dream loyal listener and viewer, so it's thnk.cc slash deb. And also Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness, if you love energy healing, if you love the that, to be healed and to be changed and shifted as do I, and why not? Because that's the thing today. So go to drdanehere.com, it's H-E-E-R.com, or accessconsciousness.com. They have courses all around the world and products uh, from every point from free all the way up and uh, you can really change your life quickly. I've been doing it for many years. I couldn't speak more highly about it. So thinkific, thnk.cc slash Deb and Dr. Dane here, which is Dr. D-A-I-N-H-E-E-R.com or accessconsciousness.com. You'll be happy you did. Debbie Dashinger, I'm a media visibility strategist out in the world and I help you to create a fierce and unique presence through coaching to write your book, taking your book to a guaranteed international bestseller and getting you booked and scheduled on media interviews. I'm a certified coach and I help my clients stop living in the shadows so they stand out and fulfill their purpose. I offer a visibility strategy session as an introduction to show you all the places and spaces you're missing right now that you could be shining your light and you don't know. Super easy. So you can sign up, just go to dare to dream radio at gmail.com for your visibility strategy session. So the today, you know, um, I've been going a lot to Agape. I found out they moved right near me. They're out of Culver City and they're walking distance, a 10, 15 minute walk from me. Agape, Dr. Reverend, Michael Bernard Beckwith, who's been on the show many times. And I just love, I love being there. It's like the most beautiful way to start a day in the morning, meditation, and then 
these beautiful services. So this was a lot of the conversation I just want to share because I was taking notes like crazy when um, Michael was speaking and it just really resonated with me and I wanted to share it with you. And here's the message, holding on, letting go. So what is beyond holding on? Coming out of your comfort zone? Everything. Everything is there. So you are invited to the unprecedented. Are you available? Available for more love, peace, joy, prosperity? Here's the truth. God has not failed you yet. Or what I've been calling God, goddess goodness, has not failed you yet. So what is after holding on? It is the beyond, which is everything. Life is a celebration. It is happening all around you. The children, the birds, the photos, the air, your animals. And if you can let go, the darkness will fade. So what I'm asking you to do is to surrender. Surrender and let go of the tip of the iceberg. Go within and begin to see there is so much more than you could ever imagine. And look at what you have the evidence of, of more. Give thanks. Open the way for better. Quit your complaining. You have evidence. There's more where that came from. There's more coming. Stop holding on. Let go. There's more. So Rachel Kahn is here. She's performed her poetry with artists and leaders such as Dakar Hip Hop Orchestra, Marion Williamson, Sage Francis, Saul Williams, and Rizel. Miss Kahn is an award-winning poet whose work has appeared in numerous books, and she's performed her poetry at Walt Disney Concert Hall, Royce Hall, Agape, and the San Francisco Palace of Fine Arts. Her accolades include the James Kirkwood Fiction Awards, Writer's Digest Short Story Awards, For the Camera Film Festival, and Landlocked Film Festival, LA Weekly Awards, Backstage West Garland Awards Critic Picks, and both the Audio and Video Award for the International Slam Idol. You can find her at rachelkann.com. Rachel, welcome to Dear the Dream. It's so awesome to have you. Here. Hi, Debbie. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. So just so the audience knows, I met you. I actually saw you as in the audience um, at this amazing event that you and I have both been at called the Greater Good Party at Mutual Friends House. And they have people come up and they do offerings of their gifts. And I remember my best friend got me there, Zhuja, and said, oh, you got to see this. Like, trust me, it'll blow your mind. And you know, you live in LA and you're like, meh, meh, whatever. It blew my mind. And you got up and did your poetry. And I don't even want to say much because people will get to experience it. We are going to offer them some of your poetry because how could we not? So I want to start by just asking you to share with the people who are watching this and listening to this, what's the work that you do out in the world? What are the gifts you come bearing that you share with us? It's such a good question. Um, I have to say too, that I was so inspired by what you just shared from Michael Beckwith from The Rev at Agape about holding on and letting go. I, I have a perfect poem to share for you when the time comes, but this is one of my favorite topics because holding on is a fist. It's like ready to engage in fight. Opening a hand can receive. A, a closed hand can't receive. If you're holding on, you can't. So I just was so excited by what you said. So my work in the world, I do, as you can tell from when I listen to my bio, it just makes me think, wow, thank God I'm still alive. I've been around a while. I have to do so many things. You know, that's like what I mostly think when I hear like, I'm still alive. Thank God. God, God is goodness. I love that. Um, my work in the world, I'm mostly known as a performance poet. But as you mentioned, I do ceremonial work. I also lead dance experiences, I lead meditations, and I lead 
I, they're Shabbat services, but they're very open. That's Sabbath for people who don't know that word. Therefore, all, everything I do is inclusive and for all people, except sometimes I do women only event, which is anyone female identifying for when we need a safe space sometimes. But really, I really like to keep things very, very inclusive. To me, that's the revolution. Mm -hmm. So in all these different places, whether I'm on stage doing a poem or I'm working in a ritual setting or I'm doing a Zumba class I'm teaching or I'm leading a meditation or I'm leading Shabbat or I'm doing one-on-one -on -one healing work, which is another thing I do, it's always the same thing. Wait. My work is to call people to their authenticity, remove blocks, clean and clear trauma, mm -hmm. if I can, help people clean and clear their trauma, you know, because I'm really just there to help. So stepping into authenticity and removing the things that block us from being ourselves. Tell me about, I have a couple of questions based on that. Shabbat, the inclusive Shabbat, where is that? What does that look like? Thank you for asking. So uh, different things, but one of the main temples that I'm working with that is like really my family, it's called Mishkan Tefillo. It's in Venice, California. Hmm. So it's, it's like a, a very old conservative temple right on Main Street, just like a little bit east of Rose for people who know what I'm talking about, but basically right where Santa Monica and Venice meet. And so once a month right now with my community there, um, Rabbi Gabriel Botnick, who's the rabbi of Mishkan, his amazing wife, Rose, who's about to get ordained, and my beloved co-creators, Rabbi Aviva Funky and her husband, Yosef Funky, and Brock Pollock, the musician, we've created a Shabbat service called Naor, which means light now, bring the light now. Mm. And what, all, what we're trying to do is create authentic spiritual experiences. I grew up with no religion. Really? My parents are, yeah, very atheist, intellectual, in a very positive way. Like they did not bring, they did not um, introduce dogma into my life on any level. They were, it was very important to them that the intellect was, Honored. I'm saying past tense, they're alive and kicking and wonderful. I'm just talking about that. Um, you know, my childhood, for my mother, it was very much about not exposing her daughters or her son to patriarchal models. Mm -hmm. She had no interest in putting us in a religious setting where women were kept separate or, you know, anything like that. And, you know... I'm hard pressed to find a religion that's not patriarchal, to be honest. I struggle with this stuff in Judaism all the time and it's everywhere. It's not just Judaism, God knows. It's Christianity, it's it's everywhere. You you think you can get away from it. And you're like, oh, and like especially in the West, like we kind of sometimes can have this little bubble we're in of our, you know, kind of oh, this is this beautiful practice, this exotic practice from elsewhere, whatever we might be grabbing, but oh, it's so you go there and you go experience like, oh, oftentimes it's patriarchal, just like, just like the same old story we heard before. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of qualify, like this is something I wrestle with still with my Judaism, but no, or is once a month. It is an evening and morning service. It's very rare that they're on the same weekend, mm -hmm. but this week, which I think this, I don't know when this gets posted, but this Friday, which is, January 11th, when, I don't know, and this tomorrow will be our Naor, it's once a month. And then Saturday morning will be the morning service. But basically we're sitting in a circle, the lights are low, we're chanting and praying, and we're trying to create an authentic experience that you can actually feel, not be like, what's going on? What is everybody saying? Why are they standing up and sitting down now? How am I supposed to be acting? That is not spiritual, it's super stressful. It's like. And, and it, it reflects my experience in so many different religious settings. Again, not, it's, you know, so we're just trying to be like, what can we do to bring authenticity and a, a truly spiritual experience to something that can get stuck 
in a ritual. Like ritual is such this loaded, powerful thing because it can become rote and, you know, a pattern that's like dug in and it's like, how do we come awake in that moment and like have, again, I, I want to have authentic experiences. I want to Let me ask people. you, so because this is um, evergreen, it's not just now, it's going to be out there forevermore, amen, and all women. Uh, what what is the website for people who might be interested? I mean, I'm interested. So what, what is Yeah, please come, come. So it's realizeparadise.com is an easy way to get to all things Rachel. So the not or info is all there. And if you forget that, you can also just go to my name, Rachel Can, R-A-C-H-E-L-K-A-N as in Nancy, N as in Nancy dot com. Great. And yeah. tell me about, I just want to get these pieces. So I have the full, like, uh, yeah, they're so, I know it's right. So many but it's cool. Well, you're a hyphen. I get it. Me too. Um, so the dance part, what, I mean, that I already can feel that's beyond Zumba. I almost have a feel it's this mm -hmm. ecstatic dance or something. What, mm -hmm. what is that for you? Well, okay. So the super nutshell version is dance was my first language. Mm -hmm. I started dancing at three, like training and, um, I also had very compromised hearing. I was almost completely deaf from a series of ear infections until I was five and a minor surgery corrected it. So I really do feel that dance was my first language, mm. you know? I get and it. So I grew up in a small town with a very small kind of dance world. There was no like modern dance class or contemporary dance. I didn't like, that wasn't a thing I was aware of when I was young, really. I knew it was like, I knew about Martha Graham and Agnes DeMille and like that there was cool <laughs> classic stuff like that, but there was no classes around. It was a very like ballet, jazz, tap, recital studio. So I got very serious in the ballet track, mm. you know, and um, studied like Russian ballet very seriously, like would go to New York in the summers as a teenager and, you know, study all summer. And, you know, eventually was like my big aha moment. I just wrote a piece about it. Um, I'll share that stuff too. I'm writing this, these new little columns called Inspirations. <laughs> and they're just little teeny short bursts of inspiration. They're super, again, just contact me if you're wondering where they are. Maybe if you Google inspiration, it'll pop up, but anyone can reach out to me. But I just wrote about this. So I was a very serious Russian ballet student. And I was like 17 and I'm at the, the peak of my career, you know, my dance journey of Russian ballet. And this was like, you know, I was like a solo in the snow dance in Nutcracker, a, a, a solo in Walk to the Flowers, you know, all the things. This was not Sugar Plum Fairy, but you know. <laughs> and so I saw a video. I'm still in high school, you know, I, and I saw a video after the performance of, I was like watching a scene from Walk to the Flowers and I was really like in the zone. I mean, I'm, I'm dancing at my best. I'm like, it's great. I'm anorexic. I'm sick. I'm like olive green. What could be better? You know what I mean? It's just really prime. So, but I mean, really, I'm dancing my best. And I look at myself, I'm watching the video, a normal, well, normally abnormal 17 year old, insecure, strange, awkward, all the things. And I'm watching the video and like, shook some moment of clarity clicked in where I could separate from all my egoic BS and whatever and like really clinically kind of watch this video and I was like okay this is this is obviously outside guidance because I was not smart enough you know but I was watching the video I'm like okay there you are dancing at your very best like your peak Russian ballet best I looked like a goofball. Like, I'm just kind of a goofy person. I mean, just my face, my body. But, like, <laughs> certain people have, you get it, goofiness is part of their, you know, whole, I also have deeply serious and all the things, but goofy's in there. I just could not really see a place for that, for all of me in Russian ballet. <laughs> I could not be my full self. I couldn't be in the zone, in the flow, in my peak, and it be okay. I could see it. It was goofy looking. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to put my, I, could, I was like, I can, this is me in five years, probably on Coke, still anorexic, like trying to be, do anything to stay skinny, 
still anorexic, in a wheelchair maybe by 35 or 40, if I keep doing this to my body, for what? Like, maybe I could get myself in a corps de ballet where they'd always be like, stop sticking out, stop being so you. And I was like, you know what? I want a bagel. <laughs> I'm hungry. And that was it. Yeah. Like whole fat. Not light. All of it. Maybe some salmon. And cape. I don't know. Let's be crazy. This is Pearl, by the way, people see it. Hi, so, Pearl. So you know, thank God, you know, I'm saying there's all that clarity, but I, I was starting to see that. And thank God also a place I was studying in New York in the summers was the Glefsky Ballet. And they were connected to a, a program called American Theater Dance Workshop that was working on kind of keeping um, great Broadway choreography alive by mm. actually making sure people knew it, not just that it was recorded somewhere and mm. teaching people, this is the original Jerome Robbins dance from West Side Story. Mm. This is the original Oklahoma, you know, Agnes DeMille, Many a New Day, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so they kind of, I think, could see my inner goofball was not gonna have the best run of it in ballet. And so they were very encouraging like saying, we think you really have a knack for musical theater dance rather than you kind of suck at ballet. Who knows how kind and gentle they were being? Like it was, they, they gently, so anyway, I got into musical, it changed my life. I got into musical theater. I began dancing very seriously. I became very seriously involved with theater. And as that started to happen, just like, we kind of talked about the patriarchy can be so exhausting. And a lot of musicals just, I wasn't interested, but like I started to find really juicy plays that were not music related. Plus I was terrified of singing, which must might come up later. So I could dance to be the dance core. And even sometimes it'd be like, uh, let's put her in the tenor section, or maybe you could like mouth it. Like it was bad, you know? So then I started doing just, regular plays. they call called straight plays, but I hate that term. Just not a musical, a play without music. Then I got really into that. Then about 10 years go by, and then I'm getting kind of fat. It's time to start exercising. I have an ex I stopped dancing and never exercised. So I'm using the term fat, but I, I wasn't done. Who cares what size I was? I was out of shape. I wasn't using my body at all. I just stopped. When I stopped dancing, I stopped worrying about it. And it caught up to me. So I started working out. I just went to the local YMCA and started taking classes and I just worked out every day. And it was, that's when I started really understanding energy and trauma and how we can hold on to things that, that might not add up according to science and math. Cause I was working out so hard every single day, changed my diet. It took a year before the weight started to come off. Wow. A year. <clears throat> Like people, and I, uh, yeah, like even my friends would be like, feel like, be like, kind of feel bad, you know, because they knew how hard I was working and they would see there was no change. Like maybe you get tested. I'll, there was nothing wrong with me. And just, I, I think it's just, we protect ourselves in different ways, you know, and we yeah. can 100%. use soul, soul packing peanuts, you know. To, to And so it just took a long time before things released. And so finally things started to rearrange in my body metabolically. And one of my teachers, again, I was so blessed to be encouraged by somebody. She was like, you need to be teaching fitness. And I was like, I am not a fitness person. Like, what are you talking about? And she was like, I need you to teach fitness. Like, I need for you to do it. I want you to be my sub when I can't teach. Like, I want you to teach. And she just her name is Ashley Marriott, and she just was a very, and I'm so blessed to have had people in my life who encouraged me to, to do things I could not see for myself. Think if I had held on to ballet, I'd be dead. I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I bet I'd be dead but right now. But I didn't even know who I would be. It was scary. I let go. My hand was open. All these things could pour. I never knew I could do, I never thought about talking on stage. Oh God, so let, let me go there because this is, this is amazing. I, and I, what I love about this story is it's what I teach from stage, it's what I teach clients. It is that your mess is ultimately your message. Your wound becomes your gift to the world, right? That click you were talking about is 
where the light goes on and you receive a wisdom for yourself that changes your life. And then you can disseminate that out to the world for the others who need to hear it and see it through your filter. And I also, by the way, really resonate because my background, I was an actress and a singer. I'm from New York. I did all that stuff as well. Not the Russian ballet, thank God. Thank they wouldn't have had me either, right? Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream, definitely different. So <laughs> I would have stood out too and wanted my bagel. I want to talk about, so here you get led into this world of performance and writing. And your accolades around writing are very impressive. Thank you. I want to know because of what ends up coming out of you that I find to be magnificent, what's your process in writing? Does something come to you and it has to be expressed? Is it something you have to sit down and do daily? Like, how does that happen for you? Such a good question. Thank you for asking. So really quick as we enter into this story, I just have to give a shout out to one other person, which is, she's still one of my besties. Her name's Amy Steinberg. And she's the one who even saw that I should be writing poetry. So in a super nutshell, because you're going to love this story, I was at an, in New York, living in New York at an audition for Jesus Christ Superstar Ensemble. We met and fell in friend love instantly. She's an incredible rocker, rock star singer, like beyond. She's actually a musical director for a, um, a spiritual center down in San Diego now. And <laughs> she saw this in me and literally nagged me for a year to write poetry. I was like, I don't want to do spoken. I don't want to write. Why do I? Why? No, it doesn't appeal. She was like, no. She's like, you have a, a weird way with words, like the way you say things. So again, somebody else seeing something in me I could not see. I didn't have a personal draw towards. She did it all. So my practice has, has changed and morphed over the years. Because at first, when I finally, after years started, it was very much like tapping a vein. There was a lot of stuff that I had never said and I and I it was it was an easy not an easy flow but it would flow I could kind of just not have a structure or a practice around it something might pop in not you know and then you know life happens and through like a series of things that were painful and griefs and traumas for me, I felt very blocked. I couldn't write. I literally, I couldn't perform. I would have such bad performance anxiety and social anxiety. It was hard for me to even go to a show and then to do the show would be so hard. And I couldn't write anything. I, I wasn't being authentic. I, I, I literally felt painted into a corner so small that I, there was, I couldn't even fit, let alone write. So my practice has morphed and changed as my needs have morphed and changed. But I teach, right? Like you mentioned, I teach writing. And so what I can share is the things that kind of always help. I do think it's good to have some sort of a practice. To me, it sounds kind of paradoxical. But what I have found that is the most effective, healing, consistent is actually community. Even though writing is such a solitary activity, I don't care if you make a writer's group with your friends or you join a workshop or it's online, it's in person, better in person because we're not around another, other people enough. But it really, it's the accountability, believe it or not, yes. when at the end of the day, when everything else falls away, and it, it doesn't matter, we're grown ups. It doesn't matter if I get an A or an F. It doesn't matter if I actually do the assignments. I'm already done with college. But there's something about that circle of people or that one other person. And you said on Wednesday, we're going to get together and share poems. Again, whether it's a writing group, it's one friend, it's a workshop. It might be sort of a, a false deadline because like, no one's going to grade you. You're not going to get fired. Nothing bad's going to happen. It's only soul accountability. It's your integrity. It's your heart. And like other things work too. And different things work for different people at different times. But if I can say one thing, even when we are at our lowest points, all of us, and it's hard for us to love ourselves or even care about ourselves or come through for ourselves, sometimes 
even if it's just the shame of bailing, <laughs> that's all you can reach for in a moment. Not that shame should be a motivator, but sometimes you're so low. All you can do is want to show up for the other people that you said would you'd be there. And there you go. 10 weeks of that, you wrote 10 pieces mm. where you could have been sitting around feeling really not so great. That's awesome. Oh my God. And, and you're getting the healing of getting to be with other humans. Yeah. <laughs> yes, for sure. Yeah. Accountability is, is really aces for pulling people forward and, and making us produce, want to produce, uh, getting the creative. Especially when it's something we want, but we also have fear around because it means so much to us. Mm -hmm. Like, Someone might want to write and also be terrified because- That's interesting. I've never heard it said like that. Something you really want, but you have fear about. That is so interesting. It's all, isn't it always that? Because yeah. when, when you care about something, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's like the same kind of thing, you know, because you're an actor, like someone who doesn't give a crap could go into an audition and be like, blah, 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 whatever. And like, they will get it. And then someone desperate comes, but it's all they did was care. It's kind of heartbreaking. You know, yeah. it's like, so it's that same thing that that level of care can make us so cautious that we become paralyzed. Well, in the time we have left, I want to make sure we at least get one of Rachel's poems in. Uh, I'm going to offer you guys here in the short break, a free gift for you. If you would like information for yourself, your being, your book, your business, get the report called Publicity, How to Become the Go-To Expert and Be Interviewed on Media. It is my gifty to you. Go to debbiedashinger.com and you can receive that now in your inbox. And uh, don't forget about Thinkific, thnk.cc slash Deb, if you need to be on an online platform and start selling programs to make passive income. Ta-da, right? Give you the lifestyle you yeah. want. And Dr. Dane here in Access Consciousness for the level of energy healing that you deserve. So if you're tuning in after we've started, this is Debbie Dashinger, Dare to Dream podcast video, radio, and I'm interviewing Rachel Can, K-A-N-N, find her at rachelkann.com. And uh, yeah, I wanna start here, Rachel, uh, and I wanna be really mindful of time because this is so important that people, I feel like it's such a gift. So if you would choose a poem to share with us, I would be delighted. I, as soon as you started talking, like I was saying about um, Reverend Michael's Speak, speaking at Agape, I knew this was the poem I had to do. So I hope I hope I will remember it because I hadn't practiced it. But I, it's like you got to trust this when it comes through. So this is the one that I feel like sharing with you. Okay. Hey, you. With the stern look behind which you try to hide your fat little sterno can heart. I see you. Your incendiary gelatinous mess of yesness glows right through you, throbbing in fabulous thoracic iambic pentameter. You're perfect. It's simply resistance that precipitates this inner turbulence. Loosen your grip on what is and let in the quantum eternal existence. Let the expired empire tumble. Let the old obsolete edifice crumble. Let the facade fall because it's all coming down anyway. <laughs> Let the haters hate. They're in a hell of their own creation. Let the pain come when it does. And when that primal yell wells up inside you, let loose, crack your sternum wishbone open, set that hungry soul of yours free. See the earthling thing? That's just the dance we're currently dancing. And even when you can get that intellectually, it's the, owning it in our wishbone souls part that gets us all edgy. We came 
to move forward through the wind as it whistles past us. We came to feel the sandpaper tongues of kittens on our wrists. We came to kiss. We came to listen to Otis Redding. We came for the forgetting and the remembering and the forgetting and the remembering and the forgetting and the remembering. We came to get down. The tree drops its pomegranate and it slams to the earth, splits open, holy abundance of seeds. Each seed brimming with tree, each tree teeming with pomegranate, each pomegranate infinite potential. Life spiraling Milky Way in all of its infinite wisdom, knowledge falling like wonder, glory, thunderbolts, spilling with the filling of des destiny like rain. And round we go again. Mm. Wow. That feels like being in magic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. How do you memorize those? I've thought that when I, I've heard you do <laughs> longer ones and I've sat back and went, all right, I've done monologues, I've done whole shows, but this woman is like poems coming out of her. How do you memorize those? And this is like my most popular question. And the answer is, it's hard. <laughs> it's hard work the thing is that's that people often are like what's a trick can you teach me a trick and it's like no it's uh, a muscle isn't it down like, we like, put a usb and we plug it in yeah it's the rote work it's the actual hard work that forms the grooves in your brain so you can remember it yeah, I totally However, agree. I want to share something. I just read this morning in a New York Times article that just came out, I think today, which is that drawing things, they now have like the scientific proof, like this new study that drawing things helps you remember them no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter what kind of thinker you are. And there's this... Um, you can read the article uh, again if someone's really curious and they can't email me i'll send it to you um but but there's this technique i don't personally use it but i'll share this since you asked and for your readers i mean viewers and listeners um that this idea you might know this from acting i just learned it recently and it was in the article too that if you if you in your mind go from place to place inside the piece you will remember it. So like if I was working on memorizing that poem I just did and I said, okay, I'm gonna do this in my childhood home because that's a space I know inside and out. So in my, in my mind, in the first part of the poem, say the first 10 lines, I'm in the kitchen and then I walk to my old bedroom. And then, so, and somebody had just told me about this technique and it, they were talking about it in the article about drawing that it's very true because you're just incorporating all the different parts of your brain. And when you add a spatial element, I guess, like drawing and visualizing things in space, that it locks things in your memory. So there's a tip for your, your peeps. All I do is just like, I read it over and over. I say it over and over. When I'm walking Pearl, the poodle you guys saw before, I do the poem over and over. And so it keep, it's another way to keep yourself honest. If I hate something I'm saying over and over, I'm going to change it. I'm going to be like, this isn't, it's a good kind of yes monitor on yourself. There's something, uh, there's a quote from your book called A Prayer on Behalf of the Broken Heart. And the quote is, your very being is a map of eternity. What do you mean by that? How is our being a map of eternity? Thank you so much for asking me about this. No one has ever asked me about mm -hmm. that. That is Torah, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what 
a lot of people call the Old Testament. We don't think of it as the old version and there's a new book. We just call it the Torah, same book. <laughs> so one of, I'm very interested in, I'm sure you'll be shocked to know the mystical elements of things, <laughs> right? So many people who are listening and watching have probably heard of the idea of the tree of life. Right. And so without going into a whole thing about it, super, super nutshell, the tree of life is energy centers called spherot. It's very reductive and not perfectly correct to say this, but it's somewhat comparable to chakras. Just so I know a lot of people are more familiar, so I know what I'm talking about. But so they, instead of going just in a straight line, they'll be like one here and then two and then one. It's a whole thing. Again, if people are interested, contact me. But the tree of life and these energy centers are a map of the universe and the map of one human. So when I'm saying your very being is a map, I'm literally giving over the teachings of some of my ancient rabbis, my ancient teachers. This specific teaching of the tree of life being a map of the human comes from a teacher named the Arizal is one of the names he's known as his name is Rabbi Isaac Luria. So like a lot of people are familiar with Zohar as like the mystical part of Kabbalah. I have them in my house. So that is one kind of Kabbalah. And the word Kabbalah just means, not just, and again, again I'm kind of reducing, but to receive, receiving of wisdom. Again, you've got to open your hands. It's all related to this. It's like receiving. So you had the Zohar, but then after the Zohar, there's other strains of Kabbalah. So Rabbi Isaac Luria, who's also known as the Arizal, came after the Zohar in Tfat in Israel. He was teaching. And so that, I, I'm so happy to, you know, credit him right now. That's where that, that's what that literally is. He's saying the human body is a tree of life. The tree of life is the universe. So that it's basically holographic. Nice. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I've never uh, thought to put all that together. Like Who that. would? Only some, not like me. That's the thing. <laughs> what I try to do a lot with my writing is that there's something like that, that you could be an atheist. You could hate religion. You could hate God. You could have no framework. And that line is still meaningful. You don't have to know anything. I'd, but perhaps if you're somebody who might be familiar with that stuff, it might ring your bell. And you'd be like, oh, she's talking about Luria. Mm -hmm. So I'm always working in my writing on things operating on different levels because, again, it's just like the spiritual services. I never want to do something that leaves people out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Bring them in. How beautiful. Yeah, so I could say there, you know, you are the Etzheim, you are Sefirot of the universe. And flatline you know what i mean so i'm saying it in a way that i'm often i'm interested in code i'm interested in code switching i'm interested in illusion and illusion illusion with an a and illusion with an i i'm interested in how my most important thing in life like we were saying i need to connect with other people so cool. words are one of the bridges we use mm. so i'm interested in how to do that and be true to my unique path mystically and spiritually religiously etc and still be completely inclusive i know it's possible without going general and vague because then you just have elevator music this is another thing like it's it's very paradoxical people can feel like oh i want to write something or create something that's very universal so that everyone can relate to it and they end up doing something general. It's paradoxical that the specific becomes the universal. Like I could um, read a story about, you know, I don't know, a, a little girl. So let's make it a little boy, even something totally different for me. A little boy who's growing up in Vietnam, you know, and is Buddhist and I can totally relate and understand, but when we're creating something ourselves, we have this feeling like we have to make sure. And, but what you do then is you just create something general that is bland and no one actually is 
super moved by it. They're just not offended either. It's like that's yeah. why John Irving is one of my favorite authors. I mean, he writes people like with quirks and personalities so detailed. They're for me completely real yeah. and unique. Uh, I find him fascinating. I, I don't know what it's like to live in his head. <laughs> but yeah. what it's like to be one of his fans and readers. And I love stuff like that, that pulls you in because the specific creates a world. Yeah. Without the specific, you just have like uh, modern art, you know, splashes of paint yeah. on the wall. And you, for me, I can't really connect. Yeah. But as soon as you get really zoomed in, yeah. like, a lot of details, it, it becomes so rich and palatable and a world that you can step into too. So I, I love that. And, and by the way, that also makes me think that's us too, right? The more uh, with, with the teaching of what you do around authenticity and being different and embracing that and all of that and making that a celebration is really the more specific you are about this is who I am, like fully embodied, you know, no apologies. Yeah. I am. Um, my hashtag, I'm on a, I don't know if you guys know what Marco Polo is, but I ha, it's, it's so fun. Marco Polo is this app and it's videos and you can create a group. It's totally private. Nobody can see it, but whomever is in the group. And I've got two other beautiful women and myself, and we have the very deeply spiritual, but also, you know, growing and changing. And we've been doing these videos like every day we get on and leave each other videos and they're everything from hilarious to, you know, sometimes there's tears to like really pulling back the curtain to something we found out or working on, but it's a lot of support. And I said, this is the year of hashtags. So this is the year of hashtag me first. Mm. I have been so good as an empath, as a clairsentient, as someone who really understands others' needs and the sensitivity of the world to really be there for people. And what that has done is, you know, naturally it's lovely to be a giver, but it's also caused me to show up in some situations considering somebody else before my own needs, which means that I've gotten sacrifice. I've chosen to self-sacrifice right. at yeah. some level. And that's not a choice anymore that I'm willing to step into. So this is my hashtag of love this year and also me first. I can't have the love without the me first. Yeah. And so it's really about what do I want? What do I need? What is this definitely different being want to experience and do and be and put out in the world? And who do I want to be with? And where do, what does that look like? And I am like 100% in that journey, okay. which is about discovering and sometimes being called out when I go off course. But um, yeah, I'm just thinking about everything you said about the soul and that even in the context of being authentic, how important that is to embody all of that. Well, you're saying such powerful things that I also am an empath and I'm also clairsentient. So um, I totally get what you're saying. And sometimes when you've been so thinking about other people, you have to figure out what it is you even want or like. Like you said, what do I want to do? What do I like? What, what is my preference? Because we've been like, oh, no, like you two, it's fine. You choose, you know, and so it's like getting back in touch with yourself. But the thing is, what's so fascinating about it is that, and we all know this, as soon as I say it, you'll be like, I, can, I know. Because when, when we are around people who are not being authentic, we know it, but we don't know why, because mm. that's their private reason. It's very unnerving. So it's like, we're like saying, oh, I want to be myself, but I don't want to make other people uncomfortable. But guess what? Not being yourself is making them more uncomfortable and distrustful. Because I know when I'm around someone who's not being authentic, I'm, my heart is open because I'm like, there's probably a, a very like sensitive wounded reason for this that is not dark and nefarious or trying to trick me or do something but it might be that i just don't know i can't we know it. it's like you can't quite tell why someone's not being their self with you and so you're like it's hard to trust and know so it's actually it's so exhausting to try to be someone you're not it's like it's or just kind of you know do all that and when we're little when we're children, it can feel and be sometimes a matter of life or death. But now we're grown-ups. 
if somebody can't accept who we are, it's going to be okay. It might be painful. It doesn't mean going around being selfish and rude and stomping on it. This has nothing to do with it because you know what? That's not your authentic self. Your authentic self doesn't want to go stomp all over people and hurt people. So when you say me first, me first is not me first, you second. It's all of us me first. It's, out, it's, it's without me. There is no, right. Exactly. Yeah, I, know I'm telling, I know you get, I'm like telling you, but I know you and, get. It. Like, you know, also oh, to your wow. point, you mentioned earlier that you used to have social anxiety. And, you used to. Uh, I still have it all the time. Me too, Rachel, by oh, the way. I don't, have, I don't have the social anxiety anymore. But even though I'm, I know I'm built to be on stage, I know it, I do it. <laughs> it's part of who I am. It's part of what my soul came here to do. I still have Michigas come up. It's like, whatever. Mm -hmm. But that said, I am fascinated by this conversation because it's making me think that for me, when I used to, and God, it was big, I used to have so much social anxiety. It was because I didn't know how to show up authentically. I didn't know how to pull back the curtain and step up and be just fully be, right? I was so busy navigating and uh, figuring out what do you want? What am I coming off? How do I sound? It's like a camera being outside of myself. And that made me very anxious to be watching myself engaging with other people while judging myself and trying to monitor and meter and change myself. It was it's crazy to talk about, but that's the way I was for so long. I mean, I feel very, I understand very well. And I don't feel like I'm fully past it. Like, this is the thing, thank God, that I found the shamanic path, you know, because, and please hear me not call myself a shaman. <laughs> I don't call myself a shaman. But I am a person who walks the shamanic path. That's my learning path. So... Your big, like you said, your messes are your, you know, it's like the things that are hard for me are where my medicine is. Yes. Totally. That's me. You know, not this isn't, but this is me. So God, I hope one day I never have social anxiety again, but uh, it's definitely not like I was saying like that, that at that point, I literally like couldn't, I, I could have social anxiety in a room by myself. It wasn't even just anxiety. Like I couldn't stand being around myself. I, I was literally, yeah. in the corner. I couldn't breathe, you know, but I still have, I still feel awkward all the time. Like, you know, I, I just sometimes feel just like, I, like very awkward in this human body and just kind of navigating in the flesh suit. And I feel very large. I don't mean like I'm heavy or skinny. It's nothing like that. I just kind of feel big and like a bull in a china shop a lot. And <laughs> this kind of like, you know, and, and, and the thing is, you know, we, we do say things that unintentionally trigger someone or piss them off or all the time. But you, that doesn't mean you, you can't know what everyone's triggers are. You can't go silent. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're, like I said, outrageous and hurtful and confrontative. God forbid, it's nothing like that. 100%. But at the same time, you can't just be silent because someone else will be offended that you're not talking anyway. So yes. you might as well be yourself. And that's a big part of the me first that I started last year was, you know, like I attract for me the most amazing clients. For me, it's just oh, like I adore these people. And I had a client last year can honestly say did not adore, like really had some problems and was uh, putting stuff in my space that was, you know, patient, 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 patient. And I got to the place was like, I am either going to hurt myself trying to constantly accommodate this incredibly neurotic human, or I'm going to speak my piece. And I opted to speak my piece knowing full well I had to detach from the outcome. This person could leave me as a client, yeah. like bless you. So many things she could speak about me in a space in which people know very untoward and turn people off to me, you know, be bad press. There was so many things that could have gone down, but I was like th that holding on. And I had to do this and say, here's the truth. Yeah. Here is the truth. You need to understand what it is to be me right now receiving you and the mm. impact it's having, 
And I got to tell you, took a couple of weeks for this person to call back with apologies for being so difficult. And I've done it in my personal life too with people like, you know, I, I, I'm a lover. I'm a total lover. I'm a total, you know, life path number two, collaboration, cooperation, yeah. partnership. That's me. But people sometimes like, I got to be real and say what's here because hurting myself is no longer an option. Not to accommodate something in your space you don't even probably know you're doing. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, that's part of the me first, too, is like me having a voice, me having a presence, me having an energy, me knowing that I get to have this space and more if I want it. You know, everything. It's, it's all in everything. So that's going to lead me. We, we have to wind up. And I can talk to you for 10 hours. Right? <laughs> this could be the, the best. The Rachel and Debbie. This is working so quick about that. Yes. Thing. Back with that authenticity thing. I have no, I've been working on this and myself and I, how, how many, how many decades can I be working on this stuff? Guess what? Forever. Because you peel back layer, there's more work to do. There's more work. It's not, oh good. I figured it out. Now I don't, I'm just floating on a cloud happy. No, the, do you just go, oh good. You're on the work path. Keep digging because you never get to the bottom. So with this thing about when somebody's doing something and it's not working for you and do you tell them or do you hurt yourself? What I have found too lately, I just can't do that anymore because when I am not, again, authentic in that way, I don't want to have a confrontation, whatever it is, I start shutting down actually. And so then I am acting weird. Mm -hmm. I, they don't know why because I haven't been clear. So now I'm being passive aggressive for lack of a better term, but I'm hurt. So a shield goes up where I may have been very open in the moment before. They don't know they hurt me. And so then I go, Shh, great, whatever, because that's my way of taking care. And I can't, even that, it's just like, I don't have time to do that to myself. But also, now we've already started building that web of confusion, me and this person. And now it's like, I can't do it anymore. That, exactly that. And I, just for an interesting point of view, to conclude this, I have, the few times I've needed to do that, it's not often, but the few times it, it's been really essential. I've had people come back to me and say, thank you. I've had other circumstances and no one has had the balls to step up and tell me, so I never knew what was going on. I've had people leave me over this and I never understood, thank you for loving me and trusting us enough to share. And I, and I just wanna say this too, it's not just about, this is going on, I need to say this. It's also about the way I say it and the way we say it to each other. There has to be a level of care and love that comes first that has precedence, that knows that the synergy that gets created, when I go there, I'm willing to go to this really big place, this vulnerable place with another, that I am inviting them in to also receive and, and share as well. So it's, it's just this incredible healing space. Imagine if we could all communicate at that level. So Rachel, what is your daily ritual or practice? What is your go-to that keeps you? I do meditate every single day, even if it's only a few minutes. I still really need to do that. Cool. And this and is here. Oh, sorry. There's more. Even if everything else falls away, hmm. even if it's just 60 seconds sometimes, because I can't even stand to be in my head very long. <laughs> and I tell them, I'm too busy. I don't know that. You know, all this stuff we tell ourselves. This is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? My dream for this year is that I will be truly seen and known on a level that um, is launched so that concerns about money, stability, like basic needs are not prohibitive to me feeling okay or being creatively abundant and getting my art out to the world. So to be very specific, if it's okay, I'm gonna just hold up my kid's book. I would like to be on more shows talking to people like you and just getting the word out and like sharing my light with people that would, would reach a critical mass so that I could have momentum to feel safe in my day-to-day -day life. 
and go to her website, by the way, because you'll see uh, things like her book and oils and other things that she's into that are possible. Um, so I'm going to do something a little interesting. I'm going to close us out, and then I'm going to have Rachel close us out with a poem because I got to hear another one. Uh, yeah, so here's how I'm going to close us out. I'm going to close us out also with a quote from an excerpt of the Ballad of Odd Lily. Please. Rachel can. Ah, this is so perfect. <laughs> right? There are no accidents. We are gathered here today as the village of oddballs, the tribe of glorious monsters. We are the fat-souled inhabitants of this fabulous planet. We do not fit the constraints of the tiny-minded. There is no more time for self-diminishment to alleviate the discomfort of others. We sing full-throated and laugh loudly. We are not threatened by human moonbeams shining their respective light. In fact, we'd ignite it for them. We delight in it. We thrive in it. Me, personally, this oddball, I'd rather be in gathering. This just might be go time. Dearly beloved, we are reunited and it feels so good. <laughs> and who knew our conversation, like, hallelujah, that is so perfect, right? Hallelujah. I mean, that, like, that was so good, Debbie. <laughs> you have tears in my eyes. I loved hearing you say that so much. I'm so grateful to you for bringing my poems to me. Like, I know, I don't think about that poem, you know, I don't sit and think about my poems. So it's like, you give me such a gift when you reflect. I get to hear my words in your beautiful presentation. Mm. Anytime, sister, anytime. I, I mean that. <laughs> that was a, a joy to say those words, meaningful. And in the next week's on Dare to Dream, I am featuring Anna Raimondi. Do you know her? My God, she's a medium from beyond. She's been on People Magazine, all sorts of stuff. You got to check her out. And Vicki Gay, these are amazing, powerful women and voices. You want to tune in to hear this number one transformation conversation in the coming weeks on Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Just remember the inspirational YouTube video is youtube.com slash Deb on the radio and get your free publicity report, how to become the go-to expert. Be interviewed on media now. Go to debbiedashinger.com. And finally, the online platform to sell your programs, make passive income, thnk.cc slash Deb. Share this radio show, video show, this link with your friends. And thanks for joining on Dare to Dream. And Rachel, my darling, would you please take us out with one of your poems? It will be my great honor. And because you mentioned it, I'm going to do the love letter to your branches and roots, the tree poem. It's a love letter. Know this. You are wonderful wild. Do not deny it. Contort akimbo. Reach your glorious limbs skyward. No more mourning your exclusion from the orchard. You were never meant to be regimented. Thank heaven. The predatory parasites who hijacked your canopy, clawing toward your inner sugar, have all been evicted. They could never truly penetrate, never claw to the center of you. They tried to prune your shine. You bloomed through it. Their attempts to graft you proved fruitless. They carved their tags into your trunk, underestimated your fortitude. How could they predict you'd claim your scars as splendor? Your roots go deeper than you ever imagined.
You are steadfast and untamable. Your branches and leaves unfurl face up, receiving the radiant waves and outrageous abundance. Today it begins. Awaken under cover of cold snap. Your glow is a holy permission slip. Your very being is a map of eternity. You are steadfast and untamable. Know this. To dance, you must let the wind whip your branches. To sing, permit the breeze to whistle through you. You are inviolable fairly spilling with potential. Come to blossom, come to fruit. Poetry mic drop. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing all of who you are with us and what a journey this interview has been. I uh, look forward to when I see you next and hopefully it will be beyond the greater good party, dear Rachel. Um, I'm just so taken with you and I'm so glad you're not a Russian ballet star so that you <laughs> and gift us with this, this depth and wisdom and beauty that you share. So thank you so much. Thank you so, so much too. I am so receiving you and so grateful for your message and your light. And I truly am just reflecting you to yourself. So if you're taken with me, you're taken with you. <laughs> Be well, sister. You too.